In the Christian Bible, you need blood. Hebrews 9.22 very deliberately misquotes Leviticus 17.11 and says, without the shedding of blood, there's no atonement. Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Rabbi Tobias Singer's Let's Get Biblical Q&A, coming to you from the Holy Land. Rabbi, the man Tobias Singer, welcome back, sir. How are you today? Uh, very, very well. It's always a pleasure to have me on. It sure is. It sure is. Nice to join you. Thank you yeah. for informing us of that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Very good. Uh, so we shall, if you're ready to rock and roll, let's do this. Ready to go. Let's do it. All right, all right, all right. Hi, this is Lori from Iowa, and my question to Rabbi is uh, that Christians are taught that the only way for forgiveness of sins is by believing in Jesus Christ. They're taught that the Jewish people have no forgiveness of sins because there's been no animal sacrifice since the Second Temple destruction by the Romans. So that stopped the morning and evening sacrifice. Rabbi, can you please explain how Jews receive forgiveness of sin today, and will the Messiah be the one to forgive sins? Thank you. Love it, love it, love it. That's a great question. All right, I'm going to take it away. Yeah, that question um, is one of those that I don't know where to begin. So let's, uh, let's roll it this way. So as it turns out, what you're expressing is very much what what's on the minds of Christians. Christians really think that in the ancient world, the way Jews atoned for sins was through sacrificial system. If you robbed a bank, you brought a sacrifice. If you <laughs> if you ate a cheeseburger, you just brought a sacrifice. As it turns out, that wasn't the case. As it turns out, in biblical times, you had to repent for intentional sins. You had to confess your sin, turn back to God, renounce your sin, and God would forgive you. In fact, in 2 Samuel chapter, uh, excuse me, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, when King David is confronted by the prophet Nathan, in a private conversation. If you ask me why later it's important that it was a private conversation, I'll explain it. Nathan presents David with a juridical parable. And Nathan uh, conveys to David that in fact he is the one who committed an outrageous sin. David, in two words, chatasi la Hashem, which means I've sinned before the Lord, was enough for God to peer into his heart. He knew that it was broken, and Nathan replied, the Lord has already forgiven you. No sacrifice. And as it turns out, the sacrificial system for sin is in three areas, and it's not the areas that any of anyone who grew up in the Christian world would expect. Predominantly, is for unintentional sins. Conversely, if someone thought that they sinned, but there was no evidence against it, they, a, a person could voluntarily bring a whole burnt offering. There's an asham, that means if you confess the sin, again, weakening the original act. And if you brought a sacrifice in a state of impurity and you wanted to show God that you really regretted what you did, you would do it demonstrably by bring an offering in a state of purity or the high priest doing a few on Yom Kippur. So that's not a vicarious atonement, Leviticus 16, 16. As it turns out, the, the prophets anticipated that people would become obsessed with a sacrificial system. In the seventh chapter of the book of Jeremiah, a chapter, a speech, an oracle that the prophet gave that nearly got him killed. But in it, he criticized the children of Israel 
and told them that they were very foolish by thinking that sacrifices were going to help them. In that context, Jeremiah is speaking toward the end of the first temple period, dissuading his listeners that any sacrifice could possibly help them, any sacrifice would enable them to defeat the Babylonian Empire. And he said, stop screaming, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. No. And in verse 21, he says, when did God tell you that you should, when you went out of Egypt, that you should bring a sacrifice for sin? It was well anticipated in the Hebrew Bible that people would misapprehend this ritual, which really brought you closer to God. It wasn't some weird ritual that simply expiated sin like in the pagan world. People were under the apprehension that they could, um, that somehow the blood would save them. I speak about this a lot in, in Let's Get Biblical, both volume one and volume two. In Hosea chapter six, verse six, that's really important because Hosea is speaking to a northern kingdom that very often didn't have access to the temple. He says, I desire love, loving kindness and not sacrifices, the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Moreover, the Messiah is never to atone for sin. Never, never. There's nothing like that in Tanakh. If you read Micah chapter 6, verse 6, Micho is his real name. He was a contemporary of Hosea. He was a contemporary of Isaiah. Read chapter 6, verse 6 through 8. He too was enraged by this spiritual folly. Well, people thought they would bring a sacrifice and that would save them. And he said, God doesn't want any of that. Don't bring your burnt offerings. He wants you to return to God. But the church emphasizes over, over repeatedly that you need a blood to atone for sin. Although I'm not, I don't want to make things complicated, but very frequently in the Christian Bible, we find that, that people could be forgiven without bringing a sacrifice um, because it works for the story. We talked about that before. I, I don't want to get um, derailed from where we're focused on. But there are times when Jesus says, you know, your sin is forgiven. There's no sacrifice. And he's told, the disciples are told the end of the book of John, they could forgive sin. No, there's no there's no sacrifice involved. And he says he's telling in Mark, he, parables are being used to teach because people don't understand, so they won't repent and that won't, that will, which would forgive sin, but where's the sacrifice? But let's not get side railed. Let's stay very focused, like a laser beam here, because there's a lot at stake. Because... In the Christian Bible, you need blood. Hebrews 9.22 very deliberately misquotes Leviticus 17.11 and says, without the shedding of blood, there's no atonement. There's an exquisite conversation between Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, and Daniel. By chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar was keenly aware that Daniel was a prophet of God who was able to interpret dreams. Nebuchadnezzar once again has a very troubling dream. A tree comes into view, not any tree, but a tree that could feed a forest, wildlife, everything fed off this great, great tree, but then it was destroyed. And Nebuchadnezzar came to understand with great distress that that was him, that although he had reached heights of power, the Neo-Babylonian Empire was something the world had never seen, such a powerful nation, but that he would be destroyed. And Daniel, and I really encourage you, the viewer, there's a lot at stake here, to open up your Bible to Daniel chapter 4, verse 24, a little caution. If you're opening a Christian Bible, the passage will, will appear as chapter 4, verse 27. It's not important why they're different, but just know that they are different. The, the passages are 
numbered differently. So verse 27 in a Christian Bible is verse 24 in a Jewish Bible. It's the same passage, okay? What does it say there? Daniel is actually giving Nebuchadnezzar advice. He says, let me give you the advice that might help you out here because Nebuchadnezzar has gone down the, a very wrong path. And incidentally, you who believe in the God of Israel, if you're not studying Daniel, and if you don't know the first six chapters, there's no excuse. Because the first six chapters of Daniel read is, are very easy to read. They read like you're reading Genesis. It just reads. It's very easy to read. The last six chapters, a little challenging, but the first six chapters... And he says, let me advise you, redeem your error with charity, your sin through kindness to the poor, so that your tranquility will be prolonged. So the prophet Daniel, this is not anyone, this is a prophet of God, is telling Nebuchadnezzar how to atone for sin. Incidentally, what's the context? When Nebuchadnezzar is informed of how his sins could be atoned, did this conversation take place while the temple was standing? No. Did this conversation take place in Jerusalem? Not close. It took place in, in Bavel, in southern Mesopotamia. So there was no sacrificial system. In Christian theology, this conversation was impossible. This advice made no sense because it is opposed by the prophets. Excuse me. This conversation is inconsistent with the teachings of Paul. So clearly, charity atones for sins. Um, riches will not avail on a day of judgment or day of the wrath, but charity will save a person from death. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 4. We're told by King Solomon in chapter 8. Chapter 8 contains an oracle of King Solomon, who is the author of three books in Tanakh. King Solomon, after completing the first temple, completing its building, tells us, strangely, oddly, that one day you'll be in exile in the land of your enemies far and near, and there you'll be in an, a predicament where you're going to regret what you have done. Well, what do you do? You get Jesus, Calvary, Golgotha, the cross, God's only son, so if you believe in him, you'd not perish but have everlasting life? No. If King Solomon had said that, I wouldn't be on air right now. I'd be in church right now. And so would you. Rather, King Solomon says, this is what you do. You confess your sins in heaven. You face towards this place that I have built. That's why Jewish people face the Temple Mount when we pray. God will hear your prayers in heaven and forgive you for all your transgressions. I encourage you to open up 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46 through 50 and see that this is all in context. This is not poetry. King Solomon is using standard prose. He's, he's not using the kind of language that he employs in books like Ecclesiastes or Proverbs that are more difficult, very clear. This, has, this information has to be very accessible. The Bible even tells us in Hosea chapter 14 that instead of any sacrifice, you can render bulls for the offering of our lips. So we are told repeatedly in the Hebrew Bible that if you don't have the sacrifice, which you really only need for unintentional sins, you pray, regret, confess your sin. There's not a mention anywhere, not one clear passage anywhere, that if you believe that the Messiah died for your sins, you are saved, and if you don't believe in it, you're damned. Not one. Not even in Isaiah 53 is there such a statement. 
In fact, quite, quite, quite the contrary, the one who might be saved is the servant himself, Israel, who's told that if you make your soul a restitution, so then you'll see seed, your, your life, life will be prolonged and God's purpose will flourish in your hand. It's really just quite the opposite. But the idea that you can bring sacrifices and God would forgive you, that God wants blood, 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 while that is heard repeatedly in churches, it's unknown to the Hebrew Bible, and that the Messiah is supposed to die for anyone's sins, there's nowhere. Rather, the Messiah would rebuke, he would teach, he would judge, he would judge between the nations, and as a result, people would repent. They would do tshuva. They would turn back to the God of Israel. What happens is that when we grow up in a Christian world, you sound like you have an American accent. Despite what you believe about your country, the United States is a Christian country and a rather conservative one. Christmas is a national holiday. You are very much affected by the Christian atmosphere that's pervasive all over the United States. If you want to see secular countries, go to Europe. <laughs> the United States is, a, unless you visit Europe, you don't realize how conservative and religious the United States is. This has an effect on everyone. So I always encourage people to go back to the Bible itself. Scripture tells us, turn back to God and God will forgive our sins through loving kindness, truth, and iniquity. Through loving kindness and truth, iniquity will be expiated. And through fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6. That's what the Bible says. These ideas are not consistent with the New Testament. And remember that the Christian Bible, and most importantly, Paul, because Paul's letters contain the Christian theology. Imagine for a moment, if you can atone for sins in the way that people atone for sins against you. I mean, has anyone ever hurt you or said something to you that really... Right? And did anyone ever apologize to you sincerely in your life? Did anyone ever say to you, I am so sorry for what I've done? I hope that's happened to you. Right? And if someone has, I'll bet you said, okay, I forgive you. Well, if you can forgive, you are merciful enough to forgive those who have wronged you if you thought they really meant it. God, who knows the thoughts and mind of isn't God at least as merciful as you? Doesn't that make sense? If, if you're merciful, right? And uh, uh, if not many people have said, I'm sorry to you, they should. But I would imagine that there are people who have hurt you. I'm sure you've been hurt in your life. I'm talking about emotionally. If, some, if the people who have hurt you had only said, I'm really, really sorry, you would forgive. Well, if you would... Wouldn't you expect God to be at least as merciful as you? The answer is he is, and he will forgive you if only you will turn to him. Thank you so much for your thoughtful question. All right. Very good. Okay, moving right into our caller. Caller, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. My name, um, my name is Michelle, and my question is second... Um, I get these verses so mixed up because I have reading problems sometimes. My our question is about Second Corinthians twelve seven about Paul's thorn in the flesh. Okay. And my question mm -hmm. is that Paul said that he was sent a messenger of Satan to um uh, buffet him. And he says that he was given the thorn in the flesh. And I was thinking about some um, other verses that's 
in the Old Testament, like Numbers, um, Numbers 33, that's the chapter in it, and the verse is 55, where it says that, um, I, I, um, it, um, says something about pricks, pricks in the, um, in the, uh, eyes, um, and the one in, um, Judges says something about, um, I'm, I'm uh, sorry, the, the uh, judges one is um is um chap um chapter two in verse three it says thorns thorns in the sides and the one in Joshua also said thorns in your eyes hmm, so I wanted to know how similar those those were. Okay. Great question. I've never actually heard it before, so very good. Rabbi? I want uh, to know, do you... All right. Thank you. Thank you for your question. So the question is, what did Paul mean in a very famous passage in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7? And you can be sure that um, scholars wonder what it is that Paul is saying that there was something, something, some device that Satan is using that has been an impediment to him. It's not related to the passages in the Hebrew Bible. And this is really quite open to speculation. That means, now, this is very interesting, incidentally, as an aside, that Paul is saying that this is an act of Satan that he is being hindered. As an aside, I've never said this on air, but Christians claim that Jesus defeated uh, Satan by crushing its head and drawing in Genesis 3.15, and that's the role of the Messiah. Well, it appears that Satan is doing really well here. Because when Christians are asked, but Satan is alive, if the Messiah is supposed to destroy Satan, then why is Satan doing fabulously? And the last century would demonstrate, would illustrate quite clearly that Satan is is doing as well as possible. The usual answer is not for true believers. This is not borne out. This is not borne out in in the second uh, letter to Corinth. The question is, what is bothering Paul so much? Why does he exclaim frequently that the law convicted him and made him a sinner? You see this in his um, passages uh, directed at fellow Jews that he had never met in his letter to Romans in chapter 7, he's speaking to fellow Jews, and he, and he discusses that in his youth, he only came to know sin when he became aware of the law. So what was bothering him? This is a very, very important question. Paul is fiercely antinomian, I mean, against um, ritual law. And he proclaimed that Christ is the end of the law to everyone who believes. Romans again, chapter 10. Now, one caveat here. People don't get this, but it's really easy to keep ritual law. It's so easy to keep ritual law that people who are not Jewish, but are believers in the God of Israel, Noahides, frequently keep kosher and want to keep Shabbat, and they want to keep holidays, they want to keep as much as possible. I assure you this is not difficult. And that very much tells us that 
Paul was an outsider because he didn't grasp this. What bothered Paul so much? That means why did he feel so f seized with guilt and shame that he could not overcome? That's a big, that's a very big question. What over, why was he so opposed to the law or did he feel like such a, a slave to sin? Why? What was this thorn in his own flesh? So, you know, it's not just this passage alone, but it's, you know, passages that we find in a letter written to the same audience, the Corinth, where he encourages people to be celibate like himself. Why would he say that? Why would he encourage virgins and widows to remain as such, to be like him? Those whose passions inflame them more than they control certainly get married, for it's better to be married than to burn. Why would Paul encourage celibacy? Why did he consider this virtuous? Now, he did not oppose marriage. It's very important. And I want to be very careful. In 1 Corinthians 7, he, and in other places, he encourages spouses to be good to each other, for sure. But we clearly find that uh, it, the celibacy is a gift. It's a virtuous gift. And this idea is outrageous. After all, the mitzvah to have a family and have children is very explicit in Torah from the get-go. So this idea is completely alien. It, it is, incidentally, very well known in the dualistic world. There were many pagan religions that held celibacy to be virtuous. Um, not, it's not, it wasn't just Christians. The idea of... of you know, the the Vestal Virgins to remain there. This was considered a virtue. In fact, according to the, the tradition of, of Christians who held that Mary was not born to a virgin, they held, the or, like Orthodox Christianity holds, that, that Mary's parents had sexual intercourse, but they had no pleasure from him. And Augustine encouraged Christians who were married that they should only sleep together when, they're, when they want to have children. But if they're done having children, then they should not be intimate with each other. Where the heck does this come from? It's really... It's very, this, these ideas seem odd to us today, but these ideas had a home in the ancient dualistic world where physical pleasure was considered sinful and evil, and the idea was to separate yourself from all material matters. While in Judaism, the intimacy between a man and a woman was considered the greatest height because it, you were partnering with God in having children together, right? So it's these sort of passages that you just scratch your head. One other just note, which may surprise you, of all the le letters or books in the Christian Bible, the only authors that, whose personality comes through where you get a sense of their writing style and the way that is Paul. You don't you don't get from the Gospels from Matthew, like who, who from the content you did you get ideas of where the author is taking you, but it's so many layer it's layered so many times that it, it's really very very difficult to figure out who could have written this. But Paul's letters, Paul's personality. And his writing style, he was extremely temperamental. And that's a hallmark of Paul's letters. In contrast to the book of Hebrews, it, it, the, the, person that, there's, the book of Hebrews, there's no 
temperamental writing at all, and Hebrews is writing systematically. In short, I've thought about this a long time, and I've had conversations about this with very well-known New Testament scholars, and, and they kind of feel the way I do, and there are New Testament scholars who feel this way who are Christians, like, uh, like Bishop Shelby Spong, who felt that Paul struggled with same uh, sex attraction. So this is not just like, uh, you know, I'm, I think this because I don't have a favorable view of Christianity. There's a whole host of New Testament scholars that share that view. Uh, Bishop Smong, he's no longer alive, but he held that view. He was a um, an Episcopalian bishop. So that's what I think Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, that this is what was holding him back. And perhaps this, either way, Paul does oppose homosexuality in the Christian Bible, very famously in Romans chapter 1. And that could be seen in two ways, because it, he was filled, felt so guilty about this, as Augustine confesses, and other church fathers, so he felt so, because he wrote about this so forcefully, or he was, he protested too much. It was just too much. So that I can't tell you for sure, but that's how Second Corinthians chapter 7 always struck me. Because you have to scratch your head and wonder, what's bothering this guy? Right? Like, why is Paul so obsessed with sin, the law, the Old Testament? Like, why? What is it? Why did he feel that he can't measure up? What would create so much shame that it would be consistent with Paul's writing of the, this obsession with sin, which is not to be found in Tanakh, right? Or in Tanakh, the the sin that the prophets addressed, there was great sin, but the great sin really was injustice, and Isaiah says the way that's solved and the way Jerusalem will be redeemed is through tzedakah and mishpat. So there's injustice, feeding the hungry, caring for the widow and the orphan. And 27 verse 9, idolatry. And in fact, uh, the Jews will be redeemed and forgiven uh, by destroying idolatry. This does These other things don't come up. So I, I think that uh, Shelby Spong was right. I think that's what bothered Paul. And I think that's what he is conveying in 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 12. Thank you for your question. All right. Larry, you're live on the air, brother. Go ahead and tell Rabbi your question. Good morning, Rabbi. It's great to see you again, as always, and always remember our time in Jerusalem at the Little Argentina restaurant uh, where we ate and you met my son-in-law and daughter-in-law daughter uh question when jesus enters jerusalem the people start crying out hoshana blessed he who comes in the name of the lord uh, my son-in-law asked this question isn't that what is stated during sukkot and has mm. nothing to do with passover yes <laughs> <laughs> yes yes that's true Larry, so go where are you question. going with this question? <laughs> that means, and, and they, you know, they have their palm branches out, which is a sukkah thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, what do you want me to tell you? Tell your son is very observant. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it, sometimes these <laughs> things become com conflated. And what am I going to say? You know, what am I going to say to further? Um, dismantle. <laughs> you know, they're saying, and you talk about Matthew 21, and um, you find, in fact, this is one of those lines that you find in all four Gospels. Larry, go ahead and hang up now. Um, so, Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I just can tell you that you have uh, a conflating of different um, uh, of different holidays and festivals in the Christian Bible. And Christians uh, don't consider this very significant. I would not raise this issue, and you never heard me use this as an argument, because Christians will go, like, what difference does it make? 
you know, look at the big picture. So it's, I don't recommend that you raise this as an issue to Christians, just as, you know, Passover lamb had nothing to do with atonement. If you want to talk about atonement, it would be Yom Kippur. It didn't matter. Whatever works for them is fine. Anyways, thank you for your question. All right, my friend Igor, welcome back. Go ahead and state your question. Hi, thanks a lot for receiving my call. Um, no. Rabbi, my question has to do with the small Bibles that missionaries leave in hotels. Uh, whenever I saw them, they only had the New Testament, leaving the Tanah aside, with two exceptions, and they are always the same, the Book of Psalms, and the book of Proverbs. Uh, what is particularly interesting about the about these books in the Christians' narrative? Why didn't they just leave just the New Testament or put all the books of the Tanah in the Christian translations like the other Bibles? Doesn't this go against uh, Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6, which they themselves made a point of leaving in this reduced version of the Christian Bible. I also wonder why they didn't include the book of Isaiah uh, that they cite so much to prove uh, Jesus' messianship. Can you please uh, clarify what, what is, what's in there for Christians in these two books of Psalms and Proverbs? Okay, go ahead and hang up now to me. Thank you, Igor. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you. You bet. So I've, I've thought about that a lot because I remember that in in Indonesia and in the Far East in general, you would see that sometimes. That, you know, in the night table, in the drawer, they would have um, a New Testament, but it would have the Book of Psalms. Like, wh why is that? Now, sometimes you'd see just the Christian Bible. Sometimes you'd see, if you're at the Marriott, the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, and the Book of Mormon all together. It, it seems that the, the church at different stages allowed ordinary parishioners to have certain books or no books, like the Catholic Church for a quite a long time wouldn't allow people to own their have their own Bible and it was chained to the altar and you you learned from the Bible at, as part of a liturgical service a liturgical service in both the it's not just the Catholic Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church but also in the highly liturgical services in the Anglican Church, that the, the service is very structured, and what you would learn is whatever the priest taught you, and that was it, right? So for the Catholic Church certainly was not keen on the Bible being translated into, a, into the common vernacular. The Roman Catholic Church would only allow um, the Latin translation, Jerome's Vulgate, um, the Greek Orthodox Church would be insistent on the, on the Greek Bible and the Septuagint. But at different stages, the churches did not permit the Old Testament all to be owned by parishioners. You learned what the priest taught you. The church never found the book of Psalms to, to, it never worried them because the book of Psalms, in their view, was basically filled with supplications, prayers, doxology, and nothing that would be filled with the Old Testament and like the law of Moses. So, and as it turns out, uh, I'm, I know I'm switching here, but, you know, the the Christians that defied the church and translated the Bible into the English language, you know, got themselves executed or sentenced to death. I'm thinking of William Tyndale, John Rogers. So the... What I'm conveying is throughout history, it varied. 
dramatically, but the church was always a little nervous about people having the what what Christians now call the entire Bible. So a Christian would now consider all the Hebrew Bible, what they call the Old Testament, and all the New Testament uh, to be the Bible. But they were nervous about parishioners having all of that, some of them having any of it, certainly having it translated. I mean, William Tyndale was was executed. John Rogers died of natural causes on the on the run. So they I, I'm being very uh, careful with my words here. But the as it turns out, there were periods in history where the church, various denominations were comfortable with parishioners having a New Testament accompanied by the book of Psalms which, you know, didn't contain the law of Moses, but the faith, the the grace and truth of Jesus Christ, you know. I'm thinking of the, the prologue. I'm thinking of John 117. It's, it's a verse that most people sort of glance over and ignore how important this is, you know. Um, for the law came through Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus Christ. Well, think about that. The second to the last passage of the prologue, the first 18 passages of the book of John. Let's do that again. Through so the law came through Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus Christ. It's like, Just like, munch on that for a while. What does it convey? <laughs> the law is Moses. That's Old Testament. We're not under the law. We're free from the law, right? Through through grace, you know. It's very Pauline. So the law was an epic of the past. It really could never be kept in Christian theology. It was there only to show you that you're a sinner, Galatians, Chapter three. That was the all. It was only a, a a a teacher to show you that you're a sinner. All these things are straight from the Christian Bible, but it didn't have empirical or intrinsic value. And it was only a shadow. Hebrews chapter eight through ten, Colossians chapter two. And this is all basic stuff. Right, so is this like is this rocket science to figure out why the church will be sure New Testament okay, Book of Psalms, why not, right? But the other books in the Hebrew Bible, like the Book of Joshua, like what point, like what do we need that for, right? And what do we need Deuteronomy, which contains somewhere around the hundred and thirty commandments? Like we don't need that anymore. Christ has freed us from the law. And that's where the, the coupling of a New Testament with the most harmless book, um, is all in quotation marks, to the church, the book of Psalms, was frequently coupled together for the average ordinary parishioner. If you want to learn more, the priest will read it to you in church. And that's your answer. Thank you for your question. All right, moving right on in to this next caller. All right, Joseph, welcome back. Go ahead with your question. Yeah, shalom, Rabbi. So my question this morning is on Isaiah 53, and whether it's talking about Israel or the Messiah, isn't the general theme of the chapter vicarious atonement, like someone, whether it be the nation or the individual, paying the price for the sins of the nation's and isn't that, like, by definition, vicarious atonement? Okay, so... Go ahead and hang up now. I'll ask, Thank you. All right, go ahead and hang up. Get right. Right. Good question. This is very important. So the question is, think very carefully, you, the viewer, of a time and experience that you had that caused you to reconsider your own life. It might be something traumatic, Right. Something happens, a realization that disconfirms your former beliefs and brings you around to 
Sometimes, God forbid, a person becomes ill. Sometimes I have had people tell me that they were high on drugs and said, God, if you somehow save me from this cocaine binge, I'll repent. There are people who have told me that they've watched Fiddler on the Roof and cried their eyes out, and at the end, they did tshuva. Others watched documentaries like the show on the Holocaust and Schindler's who've repented. There are triggers that cause people to repent, okay? That's the key, that cause people to do tshuva. I know so many people who, when studying about the suffering of the Jewish people, just repented and turned to the God of Israel. And it's kind of counterintuitive in a sense that if I thought there was a group of people that for some reason was so radioactive that everyone wanted, wanted to kill them, I'd want to just steer clear of them. <laughs> You'd want to stay away from the Jew. But as it turns out, we've, we're told from the get-go that the nations would be very drawn to the Jews. They would bless the children of Israel. Isaiah 60, the nations that rise and shine, for your light has come, kings will go by your light, Isaiah 60, one through three. Nations, the sons of them that afflicted you would come bowing down to you, it's the same chapter. There's something very striking about Jewish suffering in that it could trigger in the heart of a, Jew, of a Gentile the desire to do tshuva, to repent. This is a phenomenon. We don't, if we hear about other peoples that are suffering, we don't necessarily want to join their religion, right? But with the Jew is different. So what comes, at, so that's not vicarious atonement. That means it, when the Jew suffers, like most of my family was wiped out in the spring of 1944 when Hungarian Jewry was destroyed. Uh, if a person learns about just what happened in a very short span of time, in fact, Hungarian Jewry was destroyed. Half a million Jews were murdered within a very short span of time. In fact, the genocide of Jews in Hungary uh, occurred more rapidly than in any other part of Europe during World War II. Right? So, so as it turns out, uh, if someone examines that and learns about what occurred toward the end of World War II and repents, does tshuva, and becomes a Noahide, turns back to the God of Israel, may convert to Jews and may not, that's not vicarious. Vicarious means something. What does that word vicarious mean? Vicarious conveys that something died there, and that's a ransom, and that's the language used in the Christian Bible. So I'm very deliberately borrowing the word that's used in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. The ransom part it means he dies and I benefit from it. So that is an abomination. That's a mother load of very, very bad ideas. Christianity didn't invent it. The idea that virgins could be slaughtered in Central America and that you, if that would satisfy the gods, that's vicarious atonement. It's an abomination. But if I observe the suffering, you know, I, I just think about Schindler's List for a moment. It's, it's a film that probably most of you have seen. I remember I was lecturing in Binghamton University. And um, when you're driving from New York to Binghamton, so you, you travel, it's like a whole long schlep. It's like 185 miles, but you got Route 17. You're never sure how long it's going to take. So for whatever reason, I arrived in Binghamton hours before I was set to speak at the university. And the film had just come out, so I went to see it in the theater there. I had plenty of time. You know, it, 
I cried like a baby and the whole theater was, everyone was just crying, just crying. It's a very striking film. Why? Well, part of it is not for the reason, like Oscar Schindler was a German. He was not Jewish. He was a member of the Nazi party. If for a moment consider if this, the protagonist, Oscar Schindler was Jewish, the film wouldn't be as moving. What's so striking about this film, in my view, is the transformation of this man who was a womanizer, who was a profiteer from the war, and who could care less about anything but money and women and drink, right? And then he goes through a transformation because the film was in black and white, but there was the girl with the red coat. You remember her? And she's in red. The only thing in color besides the candlelights at the end. And when he sees her body taken away, he undergoes a complete transformation and gives away everything he has to save every Jew. And at the end of the war, his only misgiving was that this pen, this pen, this car, maybe I could have saved more Jews. Why is that so powerful? Why is it impossible to watch that film without completely breaking down? So I would posit, of course, the suffering of the Jews, all that, but it's what happened to this man who happened to have been a Roman Catholic German member of the Nazi party. But what is so shocking about it is his repentance and what triggered his repentance. Why does this film seize the imagination? Why does it touch people so deeply? I've thought about this a lot. And it's because Oscar Schindler himself was redeemed. He changed from a womanizer and a a person who profited from the war, who didn't care um, and couldn't understand why a one-armed Jew would be of benefit. And he changed. He changed because he observed the suffering of the Jew. And that's why this film penetrates everything and causes many people just to rethink. And I think that's the, the power of the film. And as I said, if the character, the main character was a Jewish person trying to save Jews, it wouldn't be nearly as interesting, nearly as powerful. If the person playing Isaac Stern would have been saving Jews, and the, and the film wouldn't be that, it would be interesting, but nowhere near as powerful. And that's what's conveyed in Isaiah 53, that the Gentiles, the nations of the world, you ha if you don't understand that the 53rd chapter, the first eight passages, contains a soliloquy where the nations, kings of nations, are speaking aloud in their numbed astonishment when they realize that the Jews all along were correct. And they ask the question, who would have believed this? Who would? And they conclude two things. Number one, that what caused us to repent, remember Isaiah 52, verse 15. It's very important. No context, you're dead in Isaiah. Dead, dead. So 52, 15. So shall we cast down many nations. Kings will shut their mouths because of them, which had not been told to them. Consider, will finally understand. That's literally the passage prior to Isaiah 53.1. That's the pericope prior to 53.1, where the second pericope that extends for eight passages. Okay, so the non-Jews are will exclaim this in the Messianic age. Two things. Number one, by his stripes we were healed. I mean, the suffering of the Jews caused us to repent. Number two is me pesha ami negalamo for the transgressions of my people. They suffered. I tell you, I share this with you. This is probably unique for you, but I've I've met no small number of grandchildren of Nazis. And 
in invariably they would apologize to me for what their grandparents or fathers did and i was i i couldn't say thank you because it didn't make sense to me you didn't do anything and i would tell them that they would find that very unsatisfying that invariably they wanted to be forgiven and they invariably felt that they were somehow culpable so i would say you didn't do anything you know you're not responsible for what your father did or what your grandfather did so um so that's what's going on in 53 so we have to be very careful about the word vicarious vicarious means it's a ransom the teenage girl is killed in an aztec ceremony where her chest is cut open, her heart is removed by a priest, and that satisfies the gods. And if you travel in Mexico and Central America, they have areas just loaded with the ancient Mayan and Aztec altars where children were offered to the gods to appease God. That's vicarious atonement. That's not going on here at all. It is very Jewish in Tanakh where people can see others suffering and repent. In fact, in Isaiah 57, just four chapters later, Isaiah admonishes the children of Israel, his audience, and he says, I took away the righteous of your generation. You didn't even care, which is not a good thing. So that's not vicarious atonement. That's not what's in view in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. As it turns out, as an aside, Luke held this view, this Jewish view. Luke did not, uh, this is very important strategically in the gospel problem, where you have Matthew and Luke invariably take, using almost all of Mark. But there are intriguing occasions where Luke will not pick up what Matthew picks up from Mark. So this, for those of you who are more knowledgeable about this, you have passage in Mark, and then they'll, not always, but almost, if it's picked up by Matthew, it's picked up by Luke and vice versa. And they're both using nearly all of the 679 passages of Mark. But Luke won't touch this. So there is, so whereas you have it in the ransom passage in Mark, and you have it in Matthew, because they both held that, Luke will not touch it. And in, in, in contradistinction, Luke will view atonement coming through repentance, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. It's not in Luke's view that Jesus' death had no value. It was very important in Luke's view, but it was different. In Luke's view, if you thought about Jesus' death, it would then cause you to repent, which is m more similar to Judaism. But that is not Pauline. That is not an idea that was that Mark or Matthew favored. But that was very much Luke's view or the Luke Acts view. So that's what's going on. Two things the nations are saying. The Jews triggered our repentance by a shrine we healed. And number two is that the Jews suffered as a result of our iniquity. Because of our behavior, the Jews suffered. That's what's in view. You have to read the context or you're, you're done. By the way, Isaiah 52 and 54 are both about Israel in the singular, suffering at the hands of the nations, and God saves them by his outstretched arm. Okay, so always read the context. And if you don't think context is important in the book of Isaiah, I'll challenge you to do this. Just open up arbitrarily a book of Isaiah. Just pick a number. Like, try it now, if you wish. Like, just go, just think of a number from 1 to 66, okay? That's not one of the ones, you know, just pick it. And I'm not going to tell you which one. Try it. Like, test out what I'm saying. Just pick a number from 1 to 66, and then go online and start reading it, and ask yourself, you understand what's going on. And it's very, very likely that you go, I, have n I am completely lost very quickly, because it's almost all poetry, which doesn't mean Shakespearean poetry, but it's a, a, a masterful use of the Hebrew language, which is extremely dense. And if you don't know the context, you'll have no chance in understanding it.
and test this out. You'll see what will happen if you try reading almost any chapter. There are some exceptions, but you try reading any chapter in Isaiah, pick, pick a number, go read it, and go, I don't know what's going on. Conversely, if you take the book of Judges or Joshua and open it any number, you probably will understand what's going on. You'll have, you'll pretty much pick it up pretty quickly. Okay, doesn't mean you won't have questions, but you'll understand what's happening. Thank you for your thoughtful question. All right, All right, Robert, give me one second here. Color sit tight. I'll be back with you shortly. Okay, don't hang up. All right, Mr. Lamar, you are live. Please go ahead and tell Rabbi your question. Hello, Hi, Father Dax. Yeah, oh, I'm here. Okay, I'm very here. good. Very good. Go ahead with All your right. question. Shalom. <laughs> sure. Uh, with the Old Testament um, and the the law in the Old Testament. There appears to be a requirement for us to continue to present sin atonement offerings. And that is very specific from what I read, that we have mm -hmm. to use the, Le the Levitical priesthood, um, and we have to give specific presentations to atone for our sins. Mm -hmm. Are we still responsible for doing those practices today? If so, where do we find the, the correct uh, sons of Aaron, the Levites? Where do we find those people to present those offerings? You're actually talking to one right now. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. speaking to and, one right now. So, okay, and so, okay, and so my other part to that question would be. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a delay. Let me stop looking at the TV. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mute your All TV right. for now. Uh, yeah. All right. So, and if that is the case, um, what about people who may not have people like that in their area? Um, and if we're no longer responsible for doing those practices, can you give me um, the reference in the Old Testament that relieves sure. us of that obligation? Perfect. My dear friends, hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanaktalk.com. T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K dot com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanakh Talk. Shalom. Testament that relieves sure. us of that obligation. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, said. Sure, sure. Okay, go ahead and hang so, down. Tune in for your answer. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lamar. All right, go ahead. You're not a Christian. I'm not, but Christians usually have it under their nose and don't see it. The, the, the offering, the sin offering as an example, which I think you probably have in mind, is Leviticus chapter 4, as for unintentional sins. But the Torah says that you could only bring these offerings on an altar in the temple in the place that I will choose. And Leviticus 17 very specifically, and they quote Le Levin so much, even though it begins with a conjunction and... Or because, I mean, people miss this. So the sacrificial system can only be utilized when there's a base Hamigdosh, a temple, where there's a proper Mizbeach, where there's a proper altar. As it turns out, we have to be in a state of purity, which means now we are all contaminated with... Um, we're defiled. Those two are bad words, so it's not a good word. But we all have come into contact with the dead one way or another. So we, we can't bring offerings now because we're not in a state of purity. And therefore, you, um, none of us can do that. In fact, the sacrificial system will resume in full order for unintentional sins in the Messianic age. And it's intriguing that unintentional sins in the messianic age becomes really important because those are the only sins that will occur. People will still make mistakes, careless mistakes in the messianic age because although every the reason why rebellion come to an end in the messianic age is just important, I repeat this, is not that we become robots and we have no free will. It's just, it's so obvious that it's a bad idea that no one would want to sin and i use an example is i mean i like to cook and you know you have a pot that's boiling and you have you wouldn't you would never stick your hand in boiling water i'm sure you have burnt your hand in the kitchen i'm sure you when slicing something you 
just were not holding the onion properly and cut your finger and you you feel like you really are a dummy because you weren't you weren't uh, being careful, right? So that's really what a carbon chattas is. It means how did you come to burn yourself when cooking, when preparing food in, in the kitchen? Because you were absent minded. You were not paying attention to what you were doing. You took an avocado in one hand and chopped into it with the other hand and missed. And, you know, and you feel pretty stupid when that happens. And what do you say to yourself? Like I, so that's the point. You have free will in the messianic age, but you'll do things careless. And that's where the unintentional sin comes into view. However, in Leviticus, it's only the place that I will show you. It's only on the Mizbech, only on the altar. I'm just taking the verse Leviticus 17, 10, which introduces a verse that's misquoted in Hebrews 9, 22. And we're told explicitly, as clear as possible in Tanakh that any sacrifice you want to bring when you don't have access to an altar, that in Hosea chapter 2, it depends if it's a Jewish Bible or Christian Bible, and that you should uh, render for bulls the offering of your lips, so you know it's Hosea chapter 2 verse 3 in a Jewish Bible, it's Hosea 14 verse 2 in a Christian Bible. Some Bibles actually twitch that around. So it's saying that instead of a bull, you pray. And some Bibles really don't like that and, and change it to the fruit of the, your lips. So it's very clear in the Bible that um, that the sacrificial system can only be brought by the priest in the temple, the place that God chose, on the altar, the priest has to be in a state of purity in order to carry that out. None of those, by the way, this might surprise you guys. The majority of Jewish history, there was no temple or Mishkan. The vast majority, we didn't have access to this. And you ask yourself the question, what did Daniel do to get an atonement for his sins? This is a question you may want to ask Christians. Like Daniel was clearly a righteous man. He was a saint. He was, a, and many of you watching me now consider Daniel to be like your favorite person. I don't need to tell you why, but God called him beloved. He didn't, there was no temple when he was around. Well, what did he do? And God was crazy about him. And as I said earlier in the show, look at his advice that he gave to Nebuchadnezzar, that all of his iniquities would be forgiven if he just gave charity. So, during the time of the temple, if you if you sinned unintentionally, you, the priest had to be in a state of purity. There had to be a base hamigdash. Shiloh stood for 369 years, so you gone to Shiloh. That was prior to Solomon's temple. But if you didn't have that, it was absolutely a forbidden practice, and it was a problem. I, I don't, I don't want to take too long with it. It was a big problem that people set up barbecues called bumos in their own backyards because they wanted to have private temples and that was illicit and at the Israel Museum they have them um, you can see them they've been dug up anyways thank you very much for your thoughtful question all right moving on moving on to the next caller okay Patricia you are live good with your question with Rabbi uh, Shalom uh, Rabbi Tovia you're my yes. rabbi by the way <laughs> and I appreciate your work and yours too William thank you. my question is um, in Revelation, who is the writer of the Revelation, um, 19.13, um, we see what he, I assume on this white horse is Jesus. He's clothed uh, with a robe dripped in blood, and, um, and then in the end of uh, the passage 15, he's tread the wine press of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And I, I am tried very hard to um, understand your Isaiah teachings, <laughs> but I am very new to this. I've only been out of the church or uh, Messianic movement for a short time uh, for a few months, and uh, your Isaiah teachings have been wonderful, and I have really learned so much from you in such short order. So to Isaiah 63, 1 through 6, is my... Uh, question here relative to the writer in of the Revelation. 
And who is speaking here is something that you always say to ask. And this appears to me to be a conversation between God and somebody. And it talks about uh, who is this sullied garments from Rosra. Um, he's tread the wine press alone. Uh, and he's astounded he had no help. So I'd like to hear your comments on all of that. Okay, Rabbi. Mm. Got it? So I don't really know why there's a... Um, uh, but thank you for your question. Go ahead and hang on now. Um, thank you, Patricia. I, 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 Revelation is a book that's just very different than anything else in the Christian Bible. Just it's a diff, very different Jesus. Very, very angry Jesus. <laughs> you don't really have parallels to it in in the rest of the Christian Bible. Um, in Isaiah 63, what comes into view is the destruction of Edom. Um, that means that Edom, which is the final kingdom, will be trodden down, and, and this is the day of vengeance where... Um, because Edom is the fourth beast, is the final beast, is Asof, and in which it will be destroyed. There's a very interesting passage in Isaiah 65, the very last uh, passage of the chapter, where we're told that a repetition, in a way, of Isaiah chapter 11, where the wolf and the lamb will feed together, the lion will eat straw uh, with the what would be animals of prey, but um, but ultimately the serpent will still eat the dust. It means the enemy of the diabolical enemy of God will always be the diabolical enemy of God, and therefore must be destroyed. So that's what comes into view there: the destruction of the enemies of Israel. And you, you see in Daniel 7 that you have the three kingdoms that emerge represented by three beasts, but then the fourth beast is just absolutely destroyed, is an absolute enemy of everything that's good, and it cannot be cannot be reconstituted, cannot be rebuilt. It's just a plain enemy of God. Anyways, thank you very much for your question. Okay, we will move right on into the next caller. Caller, you are live on the air. Okay, go ahead and tell us your name. Where are you calling from? So my name is Wes. No, my name is Nati Matzoff from West Orange, New Jersey. The, my question's on Hebrews 8, on where he misquotes Jeremiah 31 there. He, not just, he, I, I've, I've listened to you before that he, take, he, he deletes the word Baalti and replaces it with something with, with I had rejected, rejected them, which isn't there. But that, from the way, when I read the passage, it, that's like the least of the problems with that. The, the biggest problem is that he sort of like flip his, he flips the passage straight on its head and makes it seem, and make, say the opposite of what Zachary's saying. When, when you're is speaking of a new covenant, he's actually saying quite the opposite. But it's not just that, but like, he seems to tell you right to your face that he's flipping it on its head because he qu he actually quotes the puzzle where, where, where Yermia is defining what the Brist Kadosha is going to be, to be, where he says, I'm going to inscribe the law into their heart, hearts, into their minds. But, yeah, he, but nevertheless, he still goes ahead with his own version of, of the Brist Kadosha and says, that, no, it actually just means that, is that, you, that Jesus is going to, that Yashka is going to replace the face of Kaf, is, replace, is bringing some new covenant that he's going to play, replace it for you. I, I'm just I'm curious that as like why Christians don't see don't see this obvious problem um the um the um that if you actually forget about just reading just going actually to Yermi and reading the whole parak in context ex, ex, forget about that. Do you just, know any Christians <laughs> that read Jeremiah thirty one and I mean, do you know one Christian? That really mm -hmm. knows Jeremiah thirty-one in context. I know the answer, the answer is no. You don't know one, right, right. and the answer is Christians don't look it up. They're not interested in it. And no, I thank you for your question. Go ahead and come down to me for your answer. Thank you, Nazi. Bye bye. There we go. What is the book of Hebrews? It's thirteen chapters. 
it's a screed that goes on for 13 chapters explaining to you why Judaism is false. It's the longest argument against Judaism in all the Christian Bible. And, and in fact, um, that's how the book of Hebrews begins. The book of Hebrews starts off by saying that in the past, God spoke to our ancestors of the prophets in many ways, but in the last day, he's spoken by his son, whom he anointed all things, through whom all major. So he, he actually begins the whole book of Hold by way saying, in the past, this is how, you know, God spoke to the prophets of old. But now he's speaking through Jesus Christ. So the whole, it starts off. So the whole book of Hebrews, Mitchila Ad Soifai, from its beginning to its end, is there to convey that Judaism is no longer valid and it is all fulfilled in Jesus. And I will tell you that the reason I care about Christians, even those who curse me, is I know they're not reading Jeremiah in context. I know that. And that's why I spend a lot of time on air going through the passages themselves with the hope that there will be Christians who will read the whole chapter. Jeremiah 31, as in 30, is very committed to conveying that Israel is forever. The restoration of Klal Yisrael is in Jeremiah 30. The great tribulation of Jacob is in chapter 30. In Jeremiah 31, we have Jeremiah's opposition to vicarious atonement, which begins, and no Christian knows about it. They don't know it. They, why? Because they're evil? No. Because the churches don't teach it. Sunday schools don't teach it. They don't. So you're absolutely correct. Hebrews not only changes a passage, Hebrews 8, verse 9, alters Jeremiah 31, where it says, I was their husband. That word, Baal, actually the root appears many times in Tanakh, which means a man, a husband, or an owner. It means a master of sorts. I was their husband. That Baalti, that exact structure, only appears twice in Tanakh, both of them in Jeremiah. The earlier one is Jeremiah 30, verse 14. Okay. Hashem is saying, I am the husband of the children of Israel. This theme is not only in Jeremiah, but it's found all over Tanakh. Isaiah 54 is God is Israel's husband who has suffered miserably. That's what's going on. Do Christians pay attention? No, because they're obsessed with 53. Why? Because they're evil people. They're not evil at all. They just go to church, and this is what they hear in the in the pulpit, and they're told this. And Hebrews 8 ends by saying that which is old will, will, will disappear. And that's the point. That Jesus is here to replace the old. Jesus is higher than the angels, and he's not an angel. That's how... Hebrews begins, and why don't Christians take note of that when they say the angel Lord in the Hebrew Bible is Jesus, when the book of Hebrews begins by saying it's not the case. Greater than Moses, Joshua, Jesus is our Sabbath, he's our high priest, because he's replacing everything. Incidentally, unlike the Gospels, the book of Hebrews was written before the war with Rome. That means Judaism really posed competition. Probably the safest date for Hebrews, let's just say it's written, let's say 64, but it's certainly written before 66. It's certainly before 70 because the temple is, is, is operating in its full order. And the book of Hebrews is there to convey that it is, that the Jesus uh, way is the way. And in the past, God through, spoke to the answer. Look at the first verse of Hebrews. Take the whole book of Hebrews, verse 1 and 2 and 3. Just read it. He's saying it. In the past, God spoke to you through the prophets. That's how things went on in the past. But now we got a whole new ball game. That's how it starts. And unlike Paul's letters, which are 
Paul was a very temperamental person. So Paul could be speaking in one direction and he'll just shoot off into another direction completely. It's the way he wrote. That was his style. The, the Hebrews is written very differently. It's highly systematic. So Hebrews doesn't care about what it actually says in Jeremiah 31, that God would prepare our hearts, that people would turn back to Torah, that in those days no one will have to teach anyone about God, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. And then afterwards it says, look up at the sky, you see the sun, you see the stars, the moon. If these signs will pass before me, if there'll be, if there won't be a moon and stars in the, sky, in the sun and the sky, if the very foundation of the earth could be, so will I cast off Israel. So Jeremiah 31 is committed to conveying that Israel's forever and can never be destroyed. That's the whole point of it. And it's, a, and it's an incredible chapter because it was written by Jeremiah when, during a time when he was witnessing the destruction of the first temple. How he did it, I have no idea. It's really, he's a very difficult prophet to understand how he held his stuff together. And Jeremiah was a prophet for a very long time. He was he, he, he was a prophet for 41 years, from the age of 15 to the age of 56. A very long time. And what he absorbed, observed and endured and nearly assassinated. He wasn't assassinated. God promised him from the get-go he's not going to let it happen to him. He was almost killed. A black slave saved him from quicksand. He was he was close to death a number of occasions, but he made it. How in the midst of the disbelief of others, he managed to keep it together and view into the future, deep into the future, that Israel will be preserved and never allow his emotions to get to him. You know, he's a very young Navi. He's very young. He was a teenager when he, when he became a Navi, a prophet. In fact, when Hashem called him to be a Navi, a prophet, Jeremiah, like Moses, argued with God why he really is not the right person for this vocation. And he said, Naranachi, I'm a kid. He was. He was a teenager. Hashem says, you got what it takes. I, from the womb, I already, if you want to do it, but you have what it takes, you, you can do it. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah was a very reluctant fellow. And how he didn't give up and continued saying, but it's going to happen, is really hard to believe. But he, the book of Hebrews was written not by Paul, but someone who took his cues from Paul, because Paul's letters are done by 60. Everything Paul wrote was during the 50s, right? So this is just a few years later. So it's Pauline in its ideas. And uh, the book of Hebrews is Lahashmid Ulaharag. The book of Hebrews is there to destroy Judaism. It's done away with. That's our, it's finished. Done with. Now it's Christianity. And that's how things are being fulfilled. And and Hebrews 8 is not an exception to that. How could Jesus be a high priest? It's after the order of Malkitzedek. What does that mean? Hebrews can care less. And, and Christians don't care. Why aren't they care? Because no, they're not learning Genesis 14. You know, not learning about what's the blessing of Malkit said that they gave to Abraham to defeat his enemies. Read the context. They don't. They don't. Why? Because it's just the way it is. They don't. And that's why the work of what we're doing is so important. Because the people who are are in my interlocutors are not all, but many of them are good faith actors. They mean well, but nebuch, nebuch, because they grew up in the church, they're lost. And it's our job to bring them the light of Torah, and may we see the coming of the true Mashiach, quickly in our time. Thank you. I mean, we got about time for one quick one. Maybe you got about five minutes left or Do so. Do we? I don't. Yeah, we got about five minutes still. Uh, okay, uh, Leonard, go ahead with your question. You're live on the air. Uh, yes, I was wanting to know the commandment number two eliminates Jesus being the Mashiach. And ain't Mashiach supposed to be a family man? Good enough? Yes, great question. Then you go ahead and hang up now. Thank you, brother. Uh, yeah. All right, let's go.
I figured this would be yeah. a quick wrap for you. <laughs> yeah, the Messiah is is going to have a family, and it's expressed explicitly in Ezekiel Ezekiel chapter forty six verse seventeen describes the inheritance of his children very explicitly. And was Jesus, I mean, this is like, you know, so so trivial, but it doesn't say anywhere in the Christian Bible that Jesus wasn't married or didn't have kids. I don't know. But if we take what Jesus says, it seems that he is conveying that, uh, not getting married is virtuous. So that would definitely be the, the, the historical Jesus actually say that. I don't I have no idea. I don't know what you know we find in Matthew 19 is in any way reflects what the historical Jesus I doubt it very highly. But uh yeah, Mashiach himself is a family, as Kindleh. It's in the Bible. It's in Ezekiel 46. How can Christians don't say it? Because they never look, they don't read it. They, they're bad people, evil people. No, I, look, if I was raised in a Christian home, I wouldn't be watching Rabbi Singer. I'd be cursing Rabbi Singer, really. I think, I'm not sure. If I was raised in, in a Southern Baptist church and I saw a rabbi speaking about Christianity like this, it would, it would not only would I be horrified and enraged and angry, but what I would be saying is exactly what the Christians say. There you go again, an enemy of Christ. Really, that's why they get so angry at me. Because what happens is when you read the gospel, I know I'm going off thing, but this is very important. I, I think about a lot. When you read the gospels, what you find is sweet, meek Jesus, mild Jesus, just going around healing people. And these religious Jews, for no apparent reason, just can't stand his guts. So you can imagine all that pent-up rage and anger that Christians experience when they read the Gospels, right? Now, you can't say that stuff, you know, in public in the United States because it's – if you say things against Jews in the United States, people look at you like oh, a weirdo. You know, it's just not socially acceptable. But – People say it at home. And I'm sure the Christians or former Christians who are watching me now, I'm sure that you had uncles and the, you had family members who said things about Jews that were definitely not flattering. And looking back, you cringe, right? But you knew that you you only said that around the table or you said that around your uncle and you'd both look at each other and giggle and they'd Jew me down. Well, why? It's not like... Every member of your family was so devoutly religious. What's happening is there's this pent-up rage and anger toward the Jews, understandably so, because if you're reading the Gospels, you're reading stuff where Jews are portrayed as the villains. And inexplicably, the Jews just, just are enemies of Jesus, right? And then imagine they turn on YouTube or some other channel and then watch me just explain why the core claims of Christianity are not just tenuous or implausible or torturous, but are inconsistent with Tanakh. And they go, oh, look at that Jew. He's just like the Pharisees of the New Testament. The Pharisee is there again. That's why. That's why I don't, it doesn't bother me at all. I know exactly where it's coming from. But you know what you do? You, 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 I have to imitate the ways of God. We are told that we have to be holy because God is holy. We're creating the image of God. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is merciful. So I have to take into account that all these Christians hate my guts because of what they've been exposed to. And as a result of that, they curse me and whatever. And I have to go, it's like a dog barking. I don't even hear it. I just keep spreading light, keep spreading terror, and eventually they're going to go, hey, let me look up this Jew, this Jew boy. Let me look up what he's saying. And they eventually do. And many, 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 many former Christians come up to me and say, hey, Rabbi, I just want you to know, it's you me. I used to hate you. They did. And then they one day just decided, I'm going to look it up for myself. And they look it up and go, whoa, 
the rabbi is quoting the Bible. It says it there. Then they go back to the pastor, and the pastor ha- is fumbling for an answer, which is a non-answer. So that's what usually happens. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me. Shalom. All right, all right, Rabbi, that was a great show. And before we go, I would be wrong of me to not throw this up again. Uh, guys, go to outreachjudaism.org for Rabbi's two-volume book set. And I know many of you want those CDs in hand. They're no longer in print. However, uh, going to his website, you will find them there, outreachjudaism.org. Uh, if you look at the top, scroll across the top to free audio. Click on that uh, free audio tab. Scroll down. Uh, you'll find in here all of these are titles to the titles in the books. These came first. The audio files came first. The books came later. So this is not an audio book. If you think that you're really missing out, go there. Free auto. There's a place there. If you can download everything there for just a donation of, of any amount there. So just be sure to do that. And there's a link here for support our work. Click on that and you can go there and it will show you different options that are readily available at the click of a button. So, Rabbi, once again, great show. Appreciate your time, and I look forward to seeing you uh, same time, same place next week, Hashem willing. Take care, everybody. Shalom. Bye-bye. Hello, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanakhtalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanakh Talk. Shalom. Shafa